Good afternoon, everybody, on this lovely day. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our third session today. It's on a fairer Ireland, caring for all, uh, on this Saturday of the Atheist Fine Gael Ardesh. Uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, discussion on a really important topic that I think is close to all our hearts and affects everybody really in our society. Uh, care is a topic I think that we've all been working on and we're going to look at the detail of what Fine Gael is approaching and I think we have a real opportunity to lead in this area. We are joined by a terrific panel this afternoon and thank you for joining us. We have Josepha Madigan, Minister of State with Responsibility for really important area of special education and inclusion, and a TD for Dublin Rathdan. Deputy Richard Bruton, a TD for Dublin Bay North, current chairperson of the Fine Gael uh, Parliamentary Party and a former cabinet minister, of course. Councillor Clodagh Higgins of Galway City Council, and Nikki Morley joins us from Tipperary. So a little bit of the housekeeping before uh, we get underway. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function only and include your branch membership so we know where you're coming from. In relation to the motions, we have six motions over an hour. Uh, the whole session is an hour and a half. Uh, we have representatives from all over the country, and thank you for all of your work on, on, on the motions. We will have 10 minutes to propose and second and hear speakers and vote on each motion. Um, I will call in each listed proposer to propose the motion. They will have three minutes to do so. This will be followed by a seconder and other speakers already uh, registered, and will, they will be allocated a minute as per the standing orders. Voting on motions will take place uh, after each 10-minute discussion. On the right-hand side of the, green, of the screen, you will see three tabs, the chat, the polls, and the Q&A. Click on the polls in order to vote. That seems to have been working very well, so let's hope it does the same this afternoon. You'll see the options to vote for or against a motion that has been raised. You then can click back to chat and continue to submit any comments that you might have. So as I say, uh, we have an hour and a half uh, to discuss this topic. A few very quick words about care in our society. I think it's got a new prominence with COVID-19. It's always been important. But we certainly saw how important care was during the last year, how important the quality of care was, and also, of course, the carers, those who are cared, those who are doing the caring. We clapped the carers on the street. We saw all of those frontline workers, huge numbers of women actually, providing amazing frontline services. So we need to look at the quality of those experiences for those people. What are the lessons that we've learned? Where do we go from here? on the whole question of care. I've been looking at this from a European perspective and we're trying to develop what we're calling a European care strategy. And that's where we can gather information, exchange best practice, look at what's happening at care around Europe and learn the lessons. Today, we're going to be talking about care in Ireland. Uh, what would an audit of care tell us right now? And our speakers will respond to that. So I think it's an opportunity to take a fresh look at care in the decade ahead. Uh, can we support carers more? How do we support them? What are the financial implications? What's the role of volunteers? What's the role of professionals? So how can we boost care in the community? I think we all want to see more care in the community. And of course, we're talking about that continuum. We're talking about from childhood care to care for our older citizens, right across the continuum. We're looking at Perhaps a generational shift away from institutional care started a long time ago, moving to community care, but we still need our residential services. So what are the balances uh, that we uh, need? So those are the kind of topics I think that uh, come under this, uh, this session here today. And I'm really delighted to welcome Josepha Madigan, our Minister uh, of State with special uh, with, with responsibility for special education and inclusion. And she's been doing absolutely Trojan work in, in this area. We know how important it's been in the last year for parents. We know the stresses on both children, uh, on parents and on schools. So, Josefa, I'm going to um, begin by asking you, after a difficult year for students with additional needs, what supports are there now to help students and families catch up over the summer. So do please be feel free to address that or to give 
some give us some broader reflections on your own experience in this ministry uh, in the last year. Over to you, Josepha. Thank you, Francis, um, and you're the right person to chair the session today because I know you've done a huge amount of work over the years in the area of care. Um, and I was struck by what you said there about, you know, institutions. Um, and when I think and when I think of children with additional needs, we think we think back to an era uh, in Ireland where where children with additional needs were kept in institutions for a long period of time. And I'm glad to say that we have moved on, you know, significantly since then. But obviously, we have a lot more work to do. I think at the outset, it's important to stress that it is Fine Gael that appointed the very first Minister for Special Education, which is me. And that shows that we are a caring party uh, and that we do care about those who care for, for children uh, and indeed caring for the children themselves. Um, and I know, for example, Fine Gael would have set up the Ministry for Children and, and Francis, you would have been obviously a Minister for Children. So we often get accused by, by opposition parties of not being caring as a party. And I think those two um, are examples, you know, demonstrate in a tangible way uh, how we do care for society. So I've been very struck in this role uh, as a Minister of State. It's obviously my first time being a Minister of State as well. I have a budget of two billion. Uh, and when I think back to being in Cabinet, I have now a budget that is six times what I had uh, as a Cabinet Minister. And again, that shows the significance that Fine Gael is putting on the area of special education. Obviously, there are challenges. There are huge challenges that we have to surmount. And it isn't a, a, an easy uh, ministry. Um, every day uh, I meet parents and families um, that have been on a journey with their child with additional needs. They've always felt that they're fighting the system. What I'm trying to do is, is, is take that sting out of it for them and make it a little bit easier. And just specifically to answer your question around uh, the summer provision, we are providing a programme this year um, and it's been expanded. The, the funding has been doubled from 20, million, 20 billion to, to 40. Um, and there are 81,000 children who are eligible um, now to, to attend the summer provision, which, which is amazing because 4,000 schools, in fact, every single school can apply for summer provision, uh, whereas last year we only had 800. And again, when you talk, Francis, about, you know, the COVID and how people have been affected, I do think, and I think it will be hard to disagree with the fact that children with additional needs have suffered uh, enormously, uh, and indeed their parents. And that loss of key skills and regression, uh, we were so concerned about that, that we wanted to expand the summer provision. And that's what we're doing this year. So it's it's a very valuable programme. And I think it'd be, it'd be a good uptake for it. And it's on the back as well of the supplementary programme that we ran uh, in Easter. Um, and I have to Excuse say- me, I mean, that is an amazing, uh, that is a, an amazing budget. It's, it's a huge budget um, and, you know, we have to match action, uh, our words with action um, and we need the funding and, you know, we, we can't make differences uh, in people's lives without that funding. So, for example, we have like 13,600 special education teachers now, you know, that's grown from 40 percent since 2011. And um, one of the questions I get asked frequently is around SNAs. Uh, special needs assistance and we have an unprecedented 18,000 SMAs now and that's a 70% increase since 2011. So we are putting our money where our mouth is um, and I'm absolutely determined and really passionate about this area and um, I, I think we're in the right uh, session for it here as Fina Gale because it is about caring and if we cannot look after our most vulnerable who these children with additional needs are and their families then then what are we about at all and I really think that Fine Gael, you know, for me and indeed who, who, who follows me into the future in this role, and I hope that this role will stay as a permanent uh, Minister of State position. And, um, you know, I, I think we'll be able to see in the future what, what we can do and we can change things radically for the better. It certainly has changed radically, I think, over the last number of years. I mean, the, the numbers speak for themselves, Josepha. I mean, do you think there's much, two questions, do you think there's much unmet need out there? What's your sense of the... Of, of the demand that's still there because there has been a massive increase. But can I ask you, what measures are in place linked to that question to ensure students with additional needs can access appropriate education? Are we, are we if you like, finding these children early enough? Are we responding early enough? What's your sense of how easy it is for students to access that appropriate education? Well, first of all, 
I think we have to put it in context and, and remind ourselves that we want to put equality and opportunity at the heart of our education system. And that's what I'm endeavouring to do on a daily basis. We know that education is a right and it should be vindicated as such. Um, so when you take it from that premise, everything else flows from that. Um, and when I meet a family where, who has a child, and I've met, met, met plenty, um, who, who can't find a special class place uh, for a child with, with, with additional needs, then it's my job to ensure that they get that place. So I work very closely with the National Council for Special Education. And I want to commend them for all the work that they do on an ongoing basis to help with their CNOs on the ground um, and in establishing those uh, special class places. And there's also obviously special schools. We have 126 special schools um, and they play a significant role in our community as well and are great solace um, to the families. Um, so it, it really it's all about collaboration and communication. We often hear about Section 38A of the Education Act, which is about compelling schools to open special classes. Um, but I always believe um, that we can work collaboratively with schools um, and to ensure that they get the capacity that they need. So again, the funding will help in terms of trying to provide that additional capacity uh, within the system. I've always been struck by the amazing response of many schools uh, to help children and make sure they're integrated and they get the kind of special services uh, that they need. What's your own experience in this job being of working uh, with our schools, Josefa? I have to say, and, and, and I should take this opportunity to thank all the teachers as well, and, and indeed the SNAs for, for the monumental work that they've done over COVID. It was really, really challenging for them because obviously they're dealing with sanitation issues and PPE uh, and all of those matters. And at the end of the day, teachers want to teach um, and they can't teach until they get their, their, their children back in school. And I, I was delighted that the government um, obviously um, prioritised children with additional needs to get back to school before any other child uh, in the first instance, uh, which, of course, is, is, is important. But the services that we provide um, are going to be critical. The school inclusion model is something that we're working towards. Um, I know Richard Bruton, who's on the panel, would have done some work around that. That's going to revolutionise and transform the experience in a positive way uh, for a child with additional needs. We'll have a wraparound bespoke therapeutic service for them available in schools. And we're going to be expanding that out to two new community health organisation areas over the future, uh, over the next few years. And I think that will go a long way um, to going from this day, the, that era of institutions into complete integration and inclusion in our education system. Well, thanks very much, uh, Josephine. We lost you there, but only for a few seconds. Uh, you came back again, and I think we're very clear on the uh, your commitment to this area and the amount of uh, that uh, amount of work that you've been doing, and uh, no doubt we'll be coming back to you in the course of this discussion. So next, I'm going to move on to um, to Richard Richard Bruton, who's the chairperson of our Fine Gael, uh, Parliamentary uh, Party, of course, a former Minister for Education as well as Business. And uh, Richard, um, you've been uh, really uh, developing this whole idea of a Fine Gael policy lab. And I know one of the first areas you looked at was childcare. Could you tell us something about what the idea is behind developing this policy lab and what you've been doing so far and what you hope to do in the future? So over to you, Richard. Yeah, well, no, thanks very much, Francis, and it's, it's great to be here. And um, I suppose what the Policy Lab is about is a, a new way of developing par, par, policy for the party. Um, the traditional way, I suppose, has had a very small circle of people who uh, look at the evidence and come up with policy initiatives. Uh, but I think that approach is well past uh, the its sell-by date. And what we're trying to develop is a way in which we ensure that policy making engages with people who are having the lived daily experience of the issues concerned, whether they be workers in the sector or people who are using uh, services. Uh, so what it offers to people, members in the first instance, but also essentially a wider community of people, the opportunity to become involved in policy making. And in the case of the care of the child, which is maybe the best way to illustrate it, we ran a survey which over two and a half thousand people uh, engaged with, and um, most of them from outside of the party. Uh, we then ran ACE what we call policy kitchens, which were open-ended discussions on the sort of challenges that people face in caring for children. 
And it was remarkable um, how enthusiastic people were to participate, how it generated new ideas and new ways of thinking, where it gave new insight to where, if you like, the problems lie and where potential solutions could come. So the idea now is that those engagements, uh, policy kitchens, which have thrown up ideas, they will be now uh, filtered out uh, by a task force that has both the people who have participated in those kitchens and also some other uh, members who are, who are interested and have expertise in this field. What we're looking for is genuine information that answers, uh, if like, the challenges from the bottom up. The other thing that's important about this is there is a a considerable degree of independence in the policy lab. It has an independent board uh, in which politicians are not a majority. Uh, it's chaired independently by Marion Coy, who you know. It has balance in terms of makeup in both regional, uh, gender, um, every age. Uh, we've, we sought to ensure that that board is very independent. It is it, that board which will decide at the end of the day what topics should be chosen and will decide that the initiatives that are coming forward are good enough to be published and brought to the parliamentary party for adoption. So it, it is a strong uh, board. We've also, I suppose, to make sure that ideas that come up, that we can kick the tires on them, we have a system of experts. So in the case of the child, uh, the care of the child, we have three independent experts who come from both ac academic uh, practitioners, uh, people who have great experience in the field, and they will help us ensure that proposals that we bring forward are both feasible and workable. I'm really excited by it. We have a high quality board. I think anyone who has become involved at any level in this initiative uh, sees its huge potential. Uh, in terms of the future, uh, we have two topics that I, I, I think will probably go live uh, shortly. One is around how do we build uh, resilience in terms of mental health within our community. Uh, and I think you know, that's become a, an increasingly large concern, particularly coming out of uh, the, the tunnel that has been COVID. And the second topic is care of the planet, um, which addresses, uh, I, I heard, I don't know whether people heard, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Mellis, Mark Mellis, who is the head of the Defence Forces, he, he described this morning that uh, we have intergenerational sabotage in the way in which we have used uh, the planet uh, to develop our, 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 if you like, our way of life. And we need to uh, address th that. And I believe the other topic that I would like to see is a new deal for young people. I think we need to look, particularly as we exit uh, the, the, the very difficult period for young people, which has been COVID, that we need to recognize that there is a, a new deal needed by young people, that they have been losers in many segments in in in, in the, they've borne the brunt of the job disruption they're bearing the brunt of the challenges in housing they are you know going through a leaving certificate which is simply not fit for purpose and it has created great stress during that uh, period we need to start uh, you know carving out new innovative approaches. The party's already doing that. I suppose we've pioneered the state developer in housing. We've pioneered the Climate Action Plan and the New Climate Act. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we uh, have pioneered apprenticeships uh, and a, on a scale we've never seen in this country before. But I think we need to look deeper at the issues that young people are facing and address some of the structural uh, uh, barriers that they are encountering. So sorry for such a long-winded answer, but um, I, I'm extremely excited by the concept of a policy lab and what it offers membership uh, and the wider public in a way to reshape uh, our policies for the future. No, I, I think that's great, Richard, and it's 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 terrific to hear about a way that people can get more involved on the issues they they really care about. And I think that phrase that you quoted there, uh, intergenerational sabotage. I mean, it's a fascinating one, isn't it? In terms of the sort of lifestyle and and uh, lifestyle changes, I suppose that uh, uh, all generations are being asked to to uh, adapt to. And uh, you talked about a new deal for young people. Now, maybe just before. I move on to the first motion that we have. Let me just ask you about what do you think, what do you envisage might be 
uh, included in that. We'll return to it again, but just the the the, the sort of uh, mental health, obviously. But what actions? What would you like to see happening, Richard? Well, the first thing, reform of the senior cycle. I think you know the OECD has said of our senior cycle that. Uh, it is simply not fit for purpose for the ambitions of the young people we're, uh, we're, we're, we're expecting to shape the world of the future. It actually went as far as to say uh, we, we risk turning out second class robots uh, because of this um, very old fashioned way of memory uh, examination. It's a, it's a straitjacket for both teachers and learners. Uh, I think, you know, in, in, in terms of housing, um, I think the state developer, uh, the Land Development Agency is crucial, but I think we need to recognize also that we're expecting the future uh, housing um, to be built in a compact way uh, with much higher standards uh, to protect, you know, the quality of our planet and our communities. We can't expect young first-time buyers to shoulder all the cost of uh, that much higher standard of bills that we now need to, to create. Uh, and I think we need to, to recognize that and reshape the way we, we do things. Obviously, the, the care of the planet, we, you know, it is the next generation who will have to, if you like, bear a lot of the, uh, the burden of correcting the mistakes that were made by the generation uh, of which certainly I, I'm a, a member. Uh, and we need to ensure that we uh, can move away from what I suppose people describe as the uh, take, make, use and dispose uh, world that we've created and built a lot of our, our thinking around to one that is, uh, as the experts call it, circular. In other words, that we we ensure that we take the adverse environmental impact out of the entire supply chain of everything we do. Uh, and I think, you know, thinking about what we do, what we consume, how we produce. Uh, I think there's an interesting statistic that you know, 80% of the environmental damage is uh, baked in at the design stage in the way we design our markets or our products. Uh, if we can change that, uh, we can take out that damage. And I suppose what we've seen was really optimistic. We've seen in the last you know 12 months how science has helped us to conquer a, a virus that seemed uh, was going to close down the world as we n knew it. Now we've discovered a, 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 a very successful uh, vaccine. I think in the same way, we need to look at the challenge, the global challenge of, of, of global warming and environmental degradation and harness uh, our technical capacity to fix this. Uh, and it's a really exciting uh, way in which we can rebalance those intergenerational uh, unfairness that that you know is, is is stalking the land at the moment thanks very much richard uh, plenty of food for thought there absolutely and some fascinating ideas thank you i'm going to move on now to the first motion that we have now this comes from the leash offaly constituency um it's a, a motion that a lot of other constituencies Agencies are really interested in and there's related motions from the FG Women's Network uh, who are doing amazing work, Athlone Branch, Longford Westmeath Constituency Executive, Dublin Fingal uh, Constituency Executive, John Boland Branch, uh, Scarries, uh, Drangan Clonine Branch, Dunmanway Branch, Dunboyne Branch and Wicklow Constituency Executive. Um, I'm going to read out the motion and then ask the uh, proposer to, to make it that this Ordesh calls on the government to establish a carers commission as a matter of urgency to address the serious issues being experienced by carers in Ireland and to ensure the speedy implementation of the basket of services for carers as committed to in the programme for government. <laughs> and I'm delighted to say that the proposer is Molly Buckley from the Leash Offaly constituency. Over to you, Molly. Thank you very much, Francis, and good to see you. And well done to everyone on a brilliant Ardesh. So I call on the Ardesh uh, to establish a Carers Commission, which would include the examination of the role, reliance and recognition of family carers in long-term care provision. The fracture lines of society have been expo have exposed uh, with uh, by COVID, uh, with older people, adults and children with a disability, those in the poorest health and people who care for them hit the hardest. Um, this has accelerated the need for a review, a renewed focus on our health and social systems, and has given us an opportunity to reassess the value we place on informal care, which is timely given the significant long-term care challenges that lie ahead 
due to the aging population. And we all know family carers who care around the clock behind closed doors. Family Carers Ireland have been giving great support to carers, but there is more needed. A carers commission uh, should focus uh, on including care for adults of all ages. It should re review the carers allowance to make it available to genuine full-time carers. And home supports need to be increased to ensure there is adequate supply of home care workers with the skills required to meet the diverse and complex needs of home care clients. Respite remains one of the most important interventions to support the sustainability of informal care and as such should be an important consideration in the work of the Commission. A special recognition needs to be given to family carers. The phrase, who cares for the carer, is very apt. And I have two close friends who have, been come, who have become ill as a result of physical and mental exhaustion from years of caring for loved ones. And indeed, their situation often becomes worse when the cared for person passes away because they've invested all their time, energy and love into the care of their loved ones. And there's a huge void and it's something that we need addressing. So I hope you'll support this very important motion. Thank you. Molly, thanks very much. I think you've uh, explained the issues very well there. Um, as I said earlier, it's the whole continuum of care and indeed in the programme for government, there is this commitment uh, to Carers uh, Commission. So I'm going to ask uh, Richard and Josepha to respond to this. Um, and then I'll go to some of the comments that are coming in, both for you, Josefa, and, uh, and general ones as well. So, um, uh, Josefa, you might you might start off on the idea uh, of the government establishing a, a carers commission. Um, thank you, Molly, for setting that out so comprehensively, and I'll be fully supporting your motion. Um, I, and I just want to acknowledge as well Nora Owen, because I know she's spoken an awful lot uh, on the subject, and obviously has first-hand knowledge uh, of what it's like to be a carer and I mean I think it's, as well from a party perspective we don't want to be just focusing on jobs and the economy post-COVID uh, we have to be you know talking about um, the elderly and families and, and how we look after and care for our loved ones and um, I think what the co commission needs to establish is what best practice is and um, that needs to be interrogated in, in a very forensic way um, and we also um, need to ask the question why we have people on hospital trolleys you know when they, they shouldn't be in hospital at all you know do we have enough step down facilities all of these sorts of questions uh, need to be teased out thank you thanks Joseva. i think that's a really important point about best practice uh you know what is best practice in the community uh what is best practice in our nursing homes i mean that's certainly come up over the last year you know with a a very important indeed upsetting at times conversation about that uh, but looking at all of these issues objectively I think is really important. Richard uh, you might come in here on the um, the whole question of care I mean it's something that you've been looking at from a childcare point of view but it crosses the whole continuum of life uh, and we've seen how central it is to people's lives in the last year. What are your reflections on this motion Richard and as a government uh, where we should go on this? Well, I think this motion is very welcome because um, we do need to think much more strategically about how uh, we're going to spend our retirement and how we get ensure that citizens uh, remain independent for as long as they can in that re retirement. Even since I entered politics, uh, the period we might expect to be uh, in retirement has increased by 33%, an additional six years uh, and we haven't really thought through how we cater for a growing, you know, larger elder population. Uh, I think, you know, for example, things like it's very difficult in Ireland to downsize, to right size to the sort of home that would allow you to remain independent. A lot of people remain, you know, locked in a, a home that is perhaps valuable, but uh, they haven't got the supports that they need. And we haven't really developed a policy to, to address that. We have brought in uh, access to nursing homes under fair deal, but people who want to have 
uh, care that allows them to remain independent, they don't have the same sort of options available. And now, thanks to Jim Daly, uh, you know, who used to be a TD for us in West Cork, a lot of work has gone in that there will be a scheme for people remaining, uh, you know, care within the home and supporting carers in the environment that, that people want to stay for as long as possible. Uh, you know, it is right, as Molly says, that we need to think about things like respite uh, and the support of carers, because we've seen repeatedly that when pressure comes on services, uh, it is respite for people who are caring who get squeezed. They aren't uh, the loud voices at the table uh, that I suppose dictate how budgets get shared out. Uh, you know, acute hospital will always get uh, a, a bigger uh, hearing than uh, you know care and in the in the in the home. So we've to redress that balance. And I think a commission uh, and, and it wouldn't be bad to start with Nora Owen, indeed, as a, a member of that commission. You know, I think she's been very brave to come out and uh, and explain to people, you know, the, 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 the difficulties, the challenges uh, that we as policymakers need to find solutions to. So I, I think this is a, a very timely motion. Thanks, Richard. And as you say, um, Nora has been a great voice. Uh, and there's nothing like the individual voice and individual experience to tell a story. And she has certainly told it very well and very courageously in relation to her own situation. So um, well done, Nora. Before I go to the poll, there's uh, two questions. There are two comments that have come in. Uh, Councillor Maeve O'Connell from Dunleary Rathdown asks, uh, Josepha, this is one I'm sure you're asked a lot. What has been done to address the quotes battling the system? As you acknowledge, is many parents experience of seeking support for a special needs child. Um, I think hopefully that's lessening the more and more resources that we provide, but I'll ask you that in, in a moment, Josefa. And then there's uh, on the issue of education reform, Richard, for you, Maria O'Donovan suggests encouraging young people and women to consider entrepreneurship, self-employment, creative job searches, and other ways of developing soft skill for example, she says, joining a youth section of a political party. And then she says, use design thinking to find other ways of problem solving. So there are two uh, comments that have come in. So before we go to the poll, um, Josefa, a quick response from you on supports for parents trying to, I, I guess, get a, a, an accurate assessment of what their children uh, need and Yeah, um, I, I just to go very briefly back on, on, on Molly's motion very quickly, just one aspect is around the referendum of women's place in the home and the care. Richard, that's oh, Josefa, yes, you're coming through now. OK, Josefa, did you hear me? Yeah, I just heard you there, Francis, um, and I, I was just speaking very briefly, if, if you can indulge me on Molly's motion, just about um, the care aspect around the woman's ref, uh, the referendum of a woman's place in the home and the care aspect of that. And I think the Care Commission could have a body work to, 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 to look at that as well. Um, yes, just to, to answer, um, I think it was Councillor Maeve O'Connell's question specifically, uh, very briefly, we're taking a multi-pronged approach. I mean, the first one above all is listening. Um, I mean, our job as a public representative is to listen. Um, and I want to be the voice of young people uh, and children with additional needs. Um, and in order for me to be their advocate, I have to listen to their concerns. So I'm consistently meeting with them and with parents and with advocacy groups like As I Am and Down Syndrome and Inclusion Ireland and all of those uh, bodies and representatives to establish exactly what they need. Second of all, we, we have a five year forecasting tool. So it's all about demand. Um, they work in conjunction with the um, building and planning unit uh, around uh, population demographics. Uh, where is their capacity needed? Where do we need more capacity? Um, so that has to be set down, just like we do for, for mainstream schools as well. Um, and, and obviously, we, we have an, an 800 million capital budget there as well um, in terms of infrastructure um, to assist. But the most important thing that I think so far um, and I'm just a year in this role now next month um, that I've managed to get is a commitment from the building and planning unit in the Department of Education for the very first time to say that every school 
that is built from this year forward will automatically provide SEM facilities um, and sensory rooms. So, you know, that's a big thing uh, because we don't want a situation where we're trying to band-aid um, and, and scramble to find special class places then in a rush where we don't have the capacity, particularly in high density urban areas um, where the school simply don't have the room. And um, so if we build the schools in such a way that they automatically provide those facilities, then this conversation that you and I are having with that question that Councillor Connor has asked me uh, won't exist uh, in the future at all. Thank Thanks you. very much, Josephe. Um, Richard, I'm going to hold you for a moment because I need to call the vote on motion 7-1. So please do go uh, to uh, and, and vote now and I'll give you the results when they come in. But in the meantime, I'm going to move on to the next motion. And uh, Richard, I'll bring you in uh, when we're discussing this one. You can uh, respond to that last question then as well. This is motion 7-2. It's from the Kilcullen branch in Kildare South. Now, mo uh, related motions have also come in from Meath East Constituency Executive, Tipperary Executive, Dunman Way branch, Mount Argus branch, and Dublin Fingal Constituency Executive. And the, um, the motion is that Fien Gael in government strives to be the party to deliver for families, to value and recognise the work of all parents and ensure they are supported in their childcare choices, whether that is in a childcare setting or having to pause their uh, career due to the cost of childcare, and that we do this by supporting increased flexibility and choices in childcare to assist uh, parents changing needs. And the proposer is Councillor Tracy O'Dwyer from Kildare. So Tracy, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Francis, and good afternoon, ministers, deputies, MEPs, fellow councillors and delegates. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to represent uh, Kilcullen Branch and Kildare South here today with this motion. I would like to commend Deputy Bruton and everybody involved in the policy lab in the excellent work done to date in relation to building a fairer island for all. As a mother, I was not surprised to see in yesterday's press that Ireland ranks among the world's most expensive countries for childcare, with families spending on average half of their salaries on the provision of childcare for two children. And a direct result of this is that predominantly it is Irish women that are being pushed out of the workforce, as it is just not financially viable for both parents to remain working. To give children the best start in life, we need to invest more in family-friendly policies, including childcare, to ensure parents have the necessary time, resources and services they need to support their children at every stage of development. While it is important to acknowledge that significant investment has already been made in childcare, the cost and access remains a challenge. Family-focused childcare can help parents secure a balance between caring for their children, paid work and taking care of their own well-being. However, the end of paid leave rarely coincides with the start of entitlements to affordable childcare, leaving the family struggling to fill that gap. Investment in childcare workforce, their qualifications and their working conditions to deliver quality, standardised childcare is also a fundamental key, not just in the delivery of better outcomes for our children, but also to ensure a career in childcare is competitive with potential career paths and overall put in place a solid foundation for an enhanced childcare system. As the needs for remote working continues, so does the need for flexible childcare choices. Currently, the only viable options available to parents is for, for both parents to return to work and pay the high costs of childcare if they can afford to do so, or for one parent to return to full-time work and one parent remain at home. Now, not always, but predominantly, it is the woman that remains in the home. But regardless of which parent remains at home, I would like to see this government develop a system that recognises either through tax credits or other forms, the career that has been put on hold to facilitate that parent to remain in the home to provide childcare and hopefully return to work at a later time. I am very confident that this government is the government to make real change to how we provide childcare and to developing a social contract with citizens that will protect, support and offer real affordable life choices to families at different times in their lives. On behalf of Kildare South and Kilcullen Branch, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today and speak on this motion. And I would like to commend this motion to the Ardesh. Thank you very much for your time. Comprehensive. 
uh, pro proposing of the motion. The seconder is Monica Murphy. And then the panelist, uh, one of our panelists, Nikki Morley, will also come in on this. So, uh, Monica, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to second this motion put forward by Councillor Tracy O'Dwyer. Um, I'm here in my capacity as co-chair of the Fine Gael Women's Network, and I'm also coming to you from County Waterford in Knockanore, where I'm branch secretary in Tallow. Perhaps, though, the most informed opinion I have around this topic is my role as a mother to twin girls aged three. My personal situation is that my husband is a Garda, which means he often does night duty and I'm self-employed, meaning I have to be gone early in the morning, often at seven o'clock. So while we did consider the opportunity, the, this, the um, potential for local crash services, the reality of it was that between having twins, the cost and the opening times just weren't going to work for us as a family. Besides that, we certainly didn't need the stress of getting two babies and then toddlers out of bed at a very early hour. So I'd also like to mention that, you know, cost isn't the only factor that prohibits women from going back to work or having to put their careers or their businesses on pause. Stress is another factor, which I'd like to see considered in the motion. The stress of carrying kid, children to and from places, having to be picking up and dropping off is hugely um, impactful on both women and men as parents. And it causes a mental strain, which can impact on mental health. In supporting this notion, I'd also like to make the point that many parents choose to be parents as opposed to pausing their careers. Parenting is a wonderful experience and one that many people are blessed. Others will never have the opportunity to know what it is to be a parent. So I would like to encourage people to vote yes to this motion and particularly around the words of flexible and um, options for parents. In our solution, in our, in our situation, we advertise in the local post office and we're very fortunate to be able to afford to pay somebody to come into our home, even as early as 7 a.m. to allow me to go and run my business and let my husband come home from, from night work at 8 a.m. However, this is about a fairer Ireland. And you're thinking about me as a self-employed businesswoman and my, my husband with an equally good job. Imagine how difficult this is for single parent families. Imagine how difficult it is for migrant workers. Imagine how difficult it is for stay-at-home mums who are providing critical care and administrative support to the family farm who cannot access flexible, affordable childcare. There are so many families of all types relying on unregistered, cash-paid childcare, or in some cases, it most often falls to unpaid grandmothers. All of this is part of the reason that we don't have enough women in public life in Ireland. And I am very confident that Fine Gael is the party to be able to offer unique, creative and innovative childcare solutions to all parents of Ireland. In the same way, maybe perhaps that antenatal classes are provided, perhaps we can provide some training and awareness to expectant parents so they can make the best and most informed choice for the future care of their child. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Monica. You certainly, between yourself and, Tra uh, and Tracy, you've certainly painted a, a picture of the reality of the situation facing parents. Um, before I go on to Nikki, just to say to you that there's no ambivalence at all about the Care Commission. The result of the first vote is 100% support for it. So, um, Richard, uh, you're the chair of the parliamentary party. You'll take that message back uh, to our ministers. No doubt that we're very keen. Uh, I have a personal interest in this Care Commission. I think we really need it. And I suggested it should be in the, the programme for government and delighted to see it there. So, Richard, a very clear message to you. Uh, and I'll come to you in a moment after I ask Nikki. Uh, to make some comments. Do we have Nikki here? Yes. Um, I Great. Just, Go I, ahead, Nikki. Thank you, Francis. Um, I suppose I come to this topic and this motion um, as a grassroots member um, in Longford West Mead and also as a parent and as a mum of two girls, one that is three years of age and one that is eight. And um, I suppose as a working parent, one of the biggest barriers to me um, is accessing flexible childcare options um, when children move beyond those early year care, uh, caring years and preschool years, when they're in primary school where care 
care is still needed. Um, and when the only month during the primary school year that children don't have a day off is September, um, it's very difficult for um, you know somebody who's working to access childcare every month um, from October to um, August um, and still be in a position to um, you know work full time or access um, you know time off to be able to make that happen um, as part Part of this, I think we really need to look, of, look at out of school hours care to be able to support young children through their development and um, to be able to support working families who want to both parent and provide for their families, but also to provide for other people who need to be able to access um, childcare at different times and to have those options um, accessible, affordable and in their local community. Thanks very much, Nikki. Okay. Um, the words accessible and affordable uh, keep coming up. Um, a quick word from you, Richard, before I move to the vote on motion 7-2. Yeah, no, I think what the policy lab work has revealed is both the complexity of the need, and I think you've seen it articulated by Nikki, Monica and Tracy. It is, you know, there are complex dimensions to what people need to support their lives and their choices. And that's one thing that's come out very strongly. Um, the other thing it, it, that has come out very strongly is, and to go back to that previous speaker, the need for design thinking within our communities, if we're to respond to it. Sometimes what's done from the top down by public uh, design schemes doesn't have that uh, subtlety of design uh, that, that, that responds to people's needs. And we do need to see more community-based models uh, being innovative and supportive in different ways. Um, we tend to have a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. Another thing that's come through is uh, you know, the amount of state-invested facilities that could perhaps be harnessed to, to respond to some of these needs uh, that we haven't thought innovatively about how, how they could be made available. So uh, you know, I just uh, I have very little to add to you know, the very succinct presentation by the three speakers of, of the scale of the challenge. Uh, what we're now trying to do is design some uh, solutions that set us on a different pathway. Thanks, Richard. I mean, we really have to get to that point of wraparound services uh, for children, for families, to give that kind of flexibility uh, that all of our speakers uh, spoke to, um, particularly with its, its gender impact, which is so enormous. There's a comment in uh, from the Oscar Despard branch member notes that with the exception of housing, childcare was the most common issue raised at the doorstep in the last election. It is incumbent on us to improve the situation. Um, can I now call the vote on motion 7-2 and ask you to um, take to your screens and give us your vote. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on now to motion 7-3. Um, the proposer is Councillor David McManus, Dublin Southwest Officer Board, that this Ardesh recognises the success of Fine Gael's Hot Meals programme for disadvantaged schools introduced in Budget 2019 as supporting children's wellbeing, nutrition and encouraging school attendance and extra educational achievement. Since being introduced by Fine Gael, it's a long motion. The new programme has been expanded sixfold to now benefiting some 35,000 pupils in 189 primary schools. This Ordesh calls for the Fine Gael Hot Meals programme to be expanded further to every disadvantaged school nationwide within the lifetime of this government. So, David, over to you. Thank you, Francis. On behalf of the Dublin Southwest constituency, I'm delighted to join you this afternoon. I'm Councillor David McManus and Deputy Mayor of South County Dublin. Our session is about creating a fairer Ireland, uh, caring for all within our society. And this motion is an example of what Fine Gael delivers in government as part of our values for a just society. The Fine Gael Hot Meals programme started on a pilot basis and was introduced as part of Budget 2019. And full credit goes to the then Minister for Social Protection and current Senator Regina Doherty. Since then, the Hot Meals programme has been expanded and is now replacing the cold lunch option that was in place previously. Delegates, we have seen the difference this programme has made and will continue to make for pupils in disadvantaged schools across Ireland. Only recently, Minister Heather Humphrey secured funding to expand this programme to some 35,000 pupils in 189 schools. That's 35,000 children in disadvantaged schools 
benefiting every day from a hot meal, better school attendance and higher educational achievements. Accordia, this is why we in Fine Gael entered government while others sat on the sidelines. Other parties could talk for Ireland while Fine Gael delivers for Ireland. And we should be proud of what we've achieved in government but remain impatient about what yet remains yet to be complete. Between the years 2013 and 2018, according to the Central Statistics Office, the numbers in consistent poverty fell from 9% to 5.6%, the deprivation rate halved from 30% to 15%, and wealth inequality also reduced. We must always remember, friends, that one day with Fine Gael in government is better than a thousand days spent in opposition. Our 80th Ardesh is about the future of Ireland as you emerge stronger from the pandemic, and for us in Fine Gael that we deliver a fairer, more progressive Ireland. This weekend, by supporting this motion, we demonstrate our values to support everyone across our society and to create a republic of opportunity and a fairer, more progressive society. On behalf of Dublin South West, I move this motion and I seek your support. Go Rev Mila Magath, Guiv Galair. Thank you very much indeed, David. Very well spoken on that important topic. And I'd like to call on Cloda Higgins, our Galway City Councillor, to speak to this motion also. Cloda. Uh, thanks, Francis. And I'd also like to echo uh, Minister Madigan's comments in relation to you being a wonderful choice for a chair, um, given your experience in the area. Um, I'd like to thank um, Councillor McManus for setting down this really important motion. Uh, I very much welcome it and um, we know that the Hot Meal programme has proven a real success and it's a really important initiative in terms of child, uh, ch child's well-being and nutrition and I also want to commend Minister uh, Humphreys on the work that she's done in relation to this programme and of course uh, Senator Regina Doherty when she was Minister also. Uh, research has um, found that having a hot meal is uh, does have a very positive impact on children's attendance at school as well as their physical and psychological well-being. I believe by eating a warm a school lunch and being taught about uh, healthy food choices we're giving our children a solid foundation in food and equipping them with skills for years to come. Um, <clears throat> research has informed us that children can move ahead of their peers by almost a term, by having a hot uh, meal provided. And I can appreciate that, uh, th that a hungry child cannot concentrate. So eating a balanced meal at lunchtime is really, really important for concentration. And I know I've spoken to a principal here in Galway who are availing off the program and she's reported that children are in far better form and they seem to, to sleep better and they're interacting better in school and that the school meals are also an incentive to children to come to school because unfortunately um, some parents aren't able to provide this in the home. Uh, I believe that every disadvantaged school should be able to avail of the programme and I think it's imperative that they do. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Cloda. I'm going to go uh, straight to a vote on motion 7-3 now in the interests of time, and I'll bring in our panellists at a later point. I'm um, happy to say that the result of uh, motion 7.2 on childcare provision was passed by 97.6%. So again, huge support. Uh, you know, for, I think it reflects the work we're doing in childcare, but also the, uh, the work that still needs to be done uh, in this area. So now we move on to motion 7.4. It's from the Fine Gael Women's Network with related motions from the John Boland branch, Scaries, Dunmanway branch, and Dublin Fingal uh, constituency executive. Um, uh, the proposer is Yvonne Cahillon. I'm going to read it out. That this Ordesh recognises the achievements of Fine Gael in government in recent years in the area of leave for parents, which has included paid paternity leave, paid parents leave for the first time, and the expansion of parental leave to six months, calls on the government to further examine how these reforms could be strengthened, including reviewing the time limit for the taking of leave, particularly in the context of older children or children with disability. So a very interesting motion there, and the proposer is Yvonne Cahillon. Yvonne. Yvonne. Super. Yes. Hi there. Thank you. you, everyone. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for hearing these important issues. Um, quite, quite importantly named caring for all. Um, so 
My name is Yvonne Callan. I'm constituency secretary for Cork South West. Um, it is my pleasure to propose motion 7.4 on behalf of the Demanway branch, Cork South West and the Fine Gael Women's Network. Fine Gael in government has strengthened both the paid and unpaid leave entitlements for parents with the introduction of paid paternity leave and recent introduction of paid parents leave. It has also increased the period of parental leave, which can be taken from 15 weeks to 22 weeks and since 2020 to 26 weeks, all of which are very welcome improvements. However, the uptake of parental leave has historically been low and predominantly taken by women. It is unpaid, which requires families to be able to leave on savings or on one salary or a combination of both in order to avail of it. Although it attracts statutory payment, 45% of fathers in 2018 did not avail of paternity leave, while uptake of paternity leave does appear to be increasing year on year. It is important to examine what the challenges are for parents in taking these leaves and what Fine Gael and government can do to strengthen them and support parents to take them. Parents play such a vital role in guiding and supporting their children, particularly as, they, as their children move into adolescence. Paternal involvement, involvement in early years can have a significant impact on child development and recognizing that mothers and fathers have caring responsibilities, contributes to better work-life balance, gender equality in the labor market. I would encourage Fine Gael to review the time period in which paternal leave can be taken and consider extending the time period in which it can be taken. For example, to at least 16 years of age and for children with a disability to consider extending this time limit in which it can be taken to, for example, 18 years of age. Fine Gael and government should continue to build on these various important supports for parents and in line with program for government, consider how it can strengthen and improve these supports from both a financial and a duration perspective. I note this motion comes fittingly a day before Father's Day as well. So happy Father's Day to everybody. And I now urge this Ordesh to support this motion. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And so say all of us to all of the dads out there. Um, Nikki would like to come in on this motion as well. Nikki, are you still with us there? Yes. Yeah, um, just to say, I think this is a really important issue, particularly in terms of being in the position to be able to take um, parental leave or paternity leave for parents. Parents want to be able to take the time that they need to be able to look after their children, but sometimes finances um, dictate an awful lot of decisions around that. So I think this is a really important um, issue in terms of making sure that leave is accessible for families of all. Uh, um, sh shapes and sizes. Thank you very much, Nikki. Look, some really, I think, important ideas coming through there about the kind of flexibility that would make a difference uh, for parents and for children. So I'm going to ask uh, Josefa to come in first on this and then Richard. Josefa. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to Yvonne and Nikki. Um, I think one thing that struck me about that is that extending the disability leave um, to uh, up until the age that children are 18. I think that's really valuable because a lot of these families, you know, they really need the respite. Um, and I think to, to be able to avail of that flexibility in terms of parental leave and, and uh, other leaves, I think is really important. I mean, one of the things that struck me was this conversation that we've had um, over the last number of months about maternity leave, um, particularly because Helen McEntee, and congratulations to, to Helen, who had a baby boy. Um, I'm reminded myself, Francis, when I had my two sons and I was self-employed like Monica, um, a, a self-employed uh, businesswoman at the time, and I only got eight weeks um, maternity leave with both my sons. And I'm so glad that Minister McEntee didn't have to do that and that she could take the six months because I certainly think it had an adverse impact on me. Um, I think it was it was really difficult trying to do that juggling of running a business um, and trying to mind two small children as well. And at that particular time, we didn't have parental leave or paternity leave or, or any of these leaves. So we have come a long way. And I think it's always important that we remember that. Um, but there still needs to be more done, in particular for the self-employed, uh, because the self-employed, if you're not there running your business, the money doesn't come in and you simply won't get paid. Um, and we have done an awful lot in Fine Gael 
for the self-employed, but I still think there's a lot more that we can do. Um, and, and definitely around um, more flexibility as well. Um, I, I, I would be very much in favour as well of bereavement leave. Um, and, you know, I, I think the difficulty, again, is from the employer's perspective as well, putting that hat on. We have to have the buy-in from employers as well um, to, to want to be able to give their staff um, a lot of these leaves. And, um, you know, the Tornish has been talking recently about um, this consultation around uh, paid sick leave, um, which I think is really important as well. Um, but again, it's about getting the employers to buy into it um, and to understand that a happy workforce um, means that they'll get better productivity and ultimately a better profit in their organisation. Thanks, Josefa. I mean, hopefully you and Richard will be able to take forward some of these ideas uh, in the doll. I mean, and indeed, Fine Gael have been terrific uh, in bringing in the flexibilities that we do have and the extension of time. I remember battling myself in the doll to get extensions uh, to maternity leave at the time. And you can see the range of leave we have now. And it is thanks to Fine Gael uh, government. Uh, Richard, um, you've listened to our speakers there in relation to the kind of uh, welcoming what's happened so far, but also suggesting some more flexibilities that need to be built in. Do you see this as reasonable, realistic? Absolutely. Firstly, I just would like to go back to David and Claude's motion. I think David stressed something that people in Fine Gael don't uh, say often enough, that Ireland is unique in having reduced inequality in our community over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, this is something that's not happening in other European countries, and that has been through enterprise and jobs and also a progressive tax and welfare system. But I think what people are underlining today is that we need a new innovation if we're to, to conquer the next set of barriers that are there, many of them which face women. And again, on the education side, I'd stress the need for innovation that uh, David and Claude's motion called for. Sometimes what children need isn't what, um, you know, the pupil teacher ratio being reduced. Uh, they need different types of service to break those barriers of inequality. They need earlier intervention that, than often we think about. So what I like about this motion and the previous motion is that it is asking us to think in a more innovative way about the challenges we all know we need to meet, uh, that we can be flexible and innovative and, and design solutions. And I think um, to go back to plug the policy lab, that's what we're trying to do in that. We're trying to reach down so that we understand those inflexibilities that you know, Yvonne has described, that you know, we can start to crack those uh, problems and make our programs and initiatives more effective. Thanks, Richard. Two comments that have come in. On the childcare, Marie Cullerton suggests that we need, very interesting point, Josefa, that we need childcare hubs along with the new shared workplace hubs for our new post-COVID reality. I think if we are going to have workplace hubs, we should certainly be thinking about childcare hubs. And Helen Jennings from Athen Ryan Galway comments that parental leave needs to be extended to probably 18 for parents uh, for those with a diagnosed disability, additional leave supports need to be examined. So a recurring theme there about more flexibility in uh, what we already have. And, and David and Nikki and all of you, I'm sure, will be delighted uh, that Motion 73 that uh, has been passed, that's the hot, um, uh, the, the hot school meals programme, passed by 97.2%. So again, uh, you know, very positive, all of this support, you know, for a, what is really a fair and more caring Ireland, which Fine Gael wants to support. So I now need to call um, the vote on this motion. That's 7.4 um, on this issue of flexibility and, and developing the, the supports we have uh, for parents uh, around childcare. Uh, the next motion then is 7.5. It's from the Tipperary Constituency Executive. And mm -hmm. there's also a related motion, which has been received from uh, Dunlavin in Wicklow. And I'll read it out. That this Ordesh calls on Fine Gael and government to enact in full the Epson, that's the Education <laughs> uh, for Persons with Special Education Needs Act 2004, with adequate and timely personnel, facilities and provision being given to schools and the HSE and further calls on Fine Gael to ensure child and adolescent mental health services 
are prioritized. Mental health has come up quite a bit, obviously, but are prioritized with a clear emphasis on integrated community care to support parents and children at their time of need. And the proposer is Michael uh, C. Ryan, and the seconder is Councillor Avril Cronin from Wicklow uh, County. Over to you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Ryan I'm from the Temple Moor branch. I am branch chairperson and currently Equality and Disability Officer with Tipperary Executive. I'm a former councillor, former mayor of Temple Moor, and former chair of the Irish Stammer Association. And I'd like to thank you, Francis, and everybody for your interest in this debate and for agreeing to consider the motion. I suppose the Epsom Act was passed in 2004 as putting inclusive education on a strategy footing and providing for children to have their education needs assessed and met. The parts of the Act that have not been in enacted would include the right to an education assessment of needs. That would be the right to an, edu an education assessment of needs, the development of an IEP, which is the Individual Education Plan, based on assessment, the delivery of education supports detailed in the plan and an independent uh, appeal process all legis legislated for 2004. Pupils with additional needs in schools are still not being adequately supported now. I hail Fine Gael and this government for the efforts that they're trying to do in doing that. But they're still not being adequately supported due to the lack of NCSE provisions of special education teachers and SNAs, and this is constantly a problem, but hopefully it is improving. Now, school principals uh, in May, 84% of them across the country stated that they still have insufficient NCSE support for their pupils. Now, I am a parent of Edward, who has autism, and it has been tough going and Edward is our family focus and myself and Francis have had to wait and wait to get into the system and this is where the personal story comes in we have fought and fought for diagnosis for school placement and everything that he is constitutionally entitled to my child is who he is today due only to the work and to the dedication of Angela Dawn in Lockmore National School, who I understand Minister Madigan has been to Lockmore during the week, to her teachers and the SNAs in that school. And I suppose there are still problems with getting sufficient teachers and SNAs and Fine Gael and I believe are trying to do their best to do that. Special education needs to be given more political priority and financial investment. Needs more to be done. Some children with additional needs and their parents are treated like second class citizens at times. And this is a national scandal. Put yourselves in our shoes. Our families are voters too. Our children deserve better. Our school need and deserve better. But thanks to this government and thanks to especially the Fine Gael, they're making big efforts on that part. Uh, also, I suppose the big issue would be transitioning from primary to secondary school can be a problem with places. I am sitting at a meeting some evening and the parent is sitting down there and being told by a senior she couldn't get a place for her child and being told by a senior there is always home tuition. And that is heartbreaking. So politi politicians and everyone else have to see what parents are going through. And I am, and I am a devoted Fine Gael person and a devoted person to my family at home as well. So I would propose this motion to the floor and I hope you can support this motion. And I talk from the heart here and thank you very much. Michael, thank you so much. And as I said earlier, there's nothing like a, a, a personal story and it takes courage. Uh, it, it does take courage to speak about it. And thank you for speaking to this motion uh, today. Um, Avril, you're going to second this. 
Thank you very much, Francis, and thank you um, for the opportunity to speak here today from Dunlavin, um, from Dunlavin branch here in Wicklow. My motion relates to mental health services, particularly within the community. Mental health is a key issue for all of us. We live at a time when our world is rapidly changing, particularly in light of COVID-19, and it is my sincere hope that Fine Gael will play an essential role in shaping our responses to these challenges that we face now and that we face in the future. Last year, Fine Gael published Sharing the Vision, a mental health policy for everyone, a policy that focuses on mental health promotion, prevention and early intervention. We need to ensure that the policy developed by Fine Gael is implemented. It provides a roadmap for our mental health services over the next 10 years. But we need to ensure that it is implemented to deal with the increase in demand in a new and imaginative way. I am confident that if we, as a party, pass this motion, that our TDs and ministers will ensure that it is delivered and will change lives for the better. This will take work and political commitment. There is a need to develop stronger, more appropriate mental health supports at community and primary care level. People in smaller towns and rural villages deserve access to high quality community mental health care, a community based whole of system health care service for a whole population is a key challenge for our generation. I believe that with Fina Gale at the helm, we can drive real improvement in our mental health services across Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Avril. And uh, let me just give you the result to 7.4, the leave for parents and extending and expanding the type of leave available. Again, overwhelming endorsement for that at 96.8%. So thank you all for voting on that. It's it's great to, uh, to see that support coming in. Um, I also would like to apologise to one of our branch members, that's Eleanor McSherry. She was the seconder, uh, seconder of uh, Motion 7.1. And uh, sorry, I didn't bring you in due to it technical hitch uh, so feel free to come in uh, if if you're there Eleanor but look let me put a vote to mo on motion 7.5 and I'll move on to the final uh, so the motion the vote on motion 7.5 is being taken now so do go ahead and vote on that and I will bring in our panelists uh, after the next uh, motion in the interest of time I need to move on um, uh, motion 7.6 is from the volunteer branch Dublin Rath Down we we also have a related motion received from Dublin Bay North constituency executive and Liz uh, Bowen, uh, you there Liz, is the proposer from Dublin Rathdown. Over to you Liz. Thank you Chair. The volunteer branch proposes that this Ardesh calls on the government in light of COVID-19 and its impact to increase funding resources for the provision of all health services, including maternal health services, mental health services and cancer care. This winter, the Irish people abided by the strictest COVID-19 restrictions in Europe, with one aim in mind, to reduce the spread of COVID-19, protect the ill and vulnerable, and those who are in the hospital and deliver care. As we emerge from the pandemic and begin to rebuild our economy and society, the volunteer branch seeks an increase in investment to allow for the delivery of a moderate and digitally focused healthcare system that builds on existing services, focuses on early intervention and prevention, and supports all areas of health, but especially the delivery of maternal health services, mental health services, and cancer care. The budget 2021 allocates 4 billion to protect, reform, and expand health and social care services and implement universal health care. This level of funding must well, be maintained that's, that's better, and yes. added to as we recover from this crisis and as is forecasted to meet the demands of a growing population. Our branch is not seeking more reports or new initiatives. We believe in Schlonza Care and the government's plans to build new hospitals and expand primary and secondary care. We want to see funding for the implementation of the National Cancer Strategy, the National Maternity Strategy, and sharing the vision, a mental health policy for everyone. Investment system must be done in a way that ensures expenditure is not wasted. Future budgets must be conscious of reform, delivering digital 
decarbonisation and contributing to a circular economy and our transition to a low carbon economy. While the recent cyber attack has delayed the delivery of public health services and threatened the health and well-being of all our citizens, we must continue to invest in e-health and build a better and more secure digital health system. In the last year, our health services have met so many challenges and continued to deliver for us all. To fill the gaps in services that will have emerged because of the pandemic and meet the needs of a growing population and our older citizens, we must increase funding resources for healthcare services. I commend this motion to the Ardesh. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. We had some difficulties uh, with the sound there, but I think we certainly got the uh, the main points that you're making about the support of slowing to care and the need to invest further in our health services. And it, I think our Tanishta will have something to say about that later on uh, this evening as well from the reports we've heard so far of his speech tonight. So that will be interesting to look forward to. The seconder is Monica Murphy. Monica. Thank you, Francis. Um, so hello again, everybody. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Monica Murphy. I'm here in my capacity of co-chair of Fine Gael Women's Network and I um, think this is an extremely important motion and uh, echo a lot of, of what's been said already in terms of we're still somewhat in the grip of the pandemic, but it will be years from now before the full impact of it is fully realised on the impact to health, um, maternal health, mental health and cancer care services. So I was I was I was kind of thinking about this and wondering how can we you know too often we've seen leaders have had to stand up in Dáil Éireann and apologise for the failings of the state in the past, and um, this is our emergency of our time. So how can we avoid being the leaders who have to stand up in Dáil Éireann in the future and make apologies for the failings that are that may be about to unfold in the next couple of years? So despite all of this trouble that COVID-19 and the recent health hack has caused, there are some opportunities available to us to avoid the catastrophe of the future. Um, nominally, e-health, as has just already been mentioned, to continue to drive resources and investment into e-health where we can have an appointment with a doctor or with another specialist from the comfort of our homes in the surroundings of our children, might I say, and other people we might care about given that women will often be in those roles and will put their own health last over their work and over caring for their children and, and other people who might be in their care in the home. This e-health should also be reflected in cost, making it more affordable for migrants to access health services who may also, who may also be put off by the cost and the logistics who don't always have transport in rural Ireland to get to health appointments. Um, and while I fully support this motion, I would like to make the point that it should expressly include menopausal health. Maternal health is rightfully included, yet becoming a mother is a choice. Going through the menopause is not a choice for women. Yet it is a topic often spoke about in hushed, embarrassed tones. The challenges of it are hidden from our employers and often our own friends and families. It, set, it has been set aside by successive governments as being nothing more than in the great big basket of women's problems. So I fully believe and I'm proud to be part of a party that will finally open this basket of women's problems and see and support them for the biological realities that they are, be that puberty, periods, maternal health, menopausal health, and all of the mental health and economic challenges that these biological realities bring to women. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Monica. And of course, I'd add in just to compliment what you're saying, this whole debate on fertility now, which I think we also need to have. And it has been somewhat of a, a, a silent topic, but beginning to, to get more coverage now and people speaking out personally. And I think it's all part of uh, this discussion linked to what you've uh, spoken so eloquently about uh, Monica. So um, let me just give you a result, uh, Josefa. You won't be surprised to hear that motion 7.5 on education for children and young people with a disability in the mental health services for children and young people. That's 100% uh, support coming in uh, for the development of services there. People seeing it as very intrinsic to a, a, a fairer and, uh, and caring uh, Ireland. So um, I will put the vote on motion 7.6 uh, now and ask people uh, to 
uh, give us their views on that motion. And now let me go back to, to our panelists. Let me go back, first of all, to Josefa. Josefa, you've heard quite a number of, of motions there that are relevant to the work that you're doing that involve children and young people, services uh, for children with special needs, with a disability, mental health needs needing to be taken care of more effectively in the future. So take a few minutes now to give us your reflections on those motions and uh, your own experiences uh, in government to date. And then I will go to Richard uh, to uh, hear what he has to say. Josefa. Thank you, Francis, um, and thank you to all the contributors. And there's an awful lot uh, in what you have said. And in fact, each strand could be the subject of, of a full discussion. And I hope will be a full full discussion. And um, I, I want to thank um, David and Claude as well. I didn't get to speak on their motion, but I want to thank them for, for what, they, what they said around hot meals, which I think is important. Mental health, Richard will know, is something that we discussed in the policy lab, and he, he might want to talk a little bit more on that. But I do think it's something that Monica pointed out there quite correctly. Uh, and Liz, is going to be something that's going to come down the tracks. And we don't want to be standing at the door apologising for mistakes that we've made post-COVID and something that needs to be looked at. I think that what you mentioned, France, is around fertility and, and IVF and surrogacy. Uh, I, I wrote an opinion article on surrogacy a number of years ago. Uh, it's something that it's not talked about at all. And there are more and more uh, couples dealing with IVF on a daily basis, the menopause. All of these issues um, should take up a special session, um, I, I believe, Richard, in, in, in our policy lab and discuss how we can support. Because it goes into this care bracket that we're talking about. And I was particularly moved by Michael um, and when he spoke about his son, Edward, um, and his wife, Frances. And Michael's story is, is typical to what I hear on a daily basis uh, from many different families across the country. And you can hear his frustration and, and his emotion. Um, and and I, I understand that. Um, and he actually used the word fought. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned that earlier on about fighting the system. And this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help uh, families and parents uh, in particular of children with additional needs to take that fight away from them, to streamline it, to make it easier and um, to, to put pressure on the NCSC, the National Council for Special Education, who do do wonderful work and they get 20 million from the department every year, to, but to ensure that their CNOs are engaged uh, properly on the ground with local schools, with families, so that somebody is there to hold their hand all the way through the process because it's a difficult enough journey um, but you don't need to have that extra additional um, sort of fight on your hands, um, as he put it. And just to, to, to mention to Michael that the Epson Act, I am reviewing that. It was published 17 years ago, as he said, in 2004. Um, it, 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 was, it was commenced then in 2006. And some of it has been commenced, some of it hasn't. And um, we have moved away a little bit from um, a, a model that is diagnosis led. Uh, to one that which is driven by the needs of the child um, and there's an estimate of about 235 million per year to fully implement the Epson Act but I am committed to setting up a consultation Francis I know you're under time pressure to 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 make sure that that we consult with our, our education stakeholders and um, to review that Epson Act uh, in a root and branch way so that we can provide proper services um, at the end of the day for children with special education and I just want to thank everybody for their contributions. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Josefa, and the very best of luck with your important work in the uh, years ahead. Richard, can I uh, come to you for reflections on, I think we've heard, uh, you know, very passionate, really, proposers and seconders on these motions. And people obviously see these motions and the issues they address as being at the heart of creating, you know, a, a fairer, a caring society for our citizens. And I mean, Fine Gael was known as uh, the just, you know, we did uh, have the just society as a, as, a, as a motto, if you like, as a guiding principle. And I'm I, I wanted to ask you, do you think that's still very central? And uh, is that what you see reflected in these motions? I imagine it is, but I'd be very interested in hearing your, your views on that, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the Just Society is what brought me into politics and the momentum built by Gareth Fitzgerald back in those days. And I think reflecting on my years in politics, I think, uh, as David pointed out, we have cracked inequality we, in many dimensions. You know, we've increased the participation in 
education going right through the third level, probably three times what it was. We were the lowest in Europe now, we're the best in Europe. Um, but we have a new horizons to confront. I think that's what, what, what is being uh, exposed here. Uh, I would just would give a very strong plug for uh, strengthening community-based services. Um, I think that's the model that France, that uh, Josepha has uh, developed, and I was there at the start of it. And this is saying that you know we need to have across a range of schools and preschools uh, therapeutic services that the school can access. Uh, the individual diagnosis uh, route um, is is is. is is not adequate in my view. Like we've seen the explosion of SNAs in the system, but we haven't fixed some of the problems that parents continue to encounter in getting the sort of support they, they want. So I think we have to think uh, more innovatively. And I think that's what was exciting about the NCSE's uh, approach, the pilot that's now uh, Josepha is going to expand to new areas. It, it, it says that um, you know, communities should have access to a range of services. So parents aren't left waiting long times for diagnosis, then to join a waiting list uh, that again is, is interminable. That system, I think, uh, won't serve people's needs. I think the other thing on the health motion, I mean, I'm very conscious that the health budget has probably increased by 50%, I think from about 13 billion to, you know, well over 20 billion now. Uh, and, you know, if you ask people, you know, have we seen a 50% improvement? Very few people would say yes. But the reality is that we're all, you know, getting access to new procedures, better drugs, and this is really expensive. But again, I would make the plug for the community-based service. We need to develop that and have it competing on equal terms with you know, the most expensive new drugs that are coming on stream are the most expensive uh, intervention that can happen in a, in a hospital setting. I think we, we haven't uh, you sufficiently invested in that you know, local uh, accessible resource. And at the end of the day, that's where people uh, you know, get the most satisfaction uh, and most response to their needs. So uh, you know, we are going to live in a, a, a financial constrained environment. So we have to make choices. And for me, the choice is to get more of those services and needs responded to within our communities uh, in, in an accessible way. Thanks very much, Richard. And I want to thank our other two panelists, uh, uh, Cloda and Nikki. If you'd like to come in, uh, do, do come in there. Um, I'm, I'm just looking to see if you're giving an indication of, of coming in. But no, I think we can we can move on. But just to say thank you to uh, Josepha, to uh, Richard, to Cloda, to Nikki uh, for being uh, on our panel today and to all of the proposers and seconders and those who spoke on the motion. I, I think uh, the result uh, of motion 7.6 on the increase in funding again speaks for itself. Um, the result is 94.3% on that motion. So I think what we've seen today is overwhelming support uh, for developing Fine Gael's role in creating a fairer, a more caring society. We know we have done a lot, but there are still many challenges. There's still a long way to go. And I think what today shows is that we have many ideas about how to take this forward. Many innovative ideas coming from our members, our councillors, our ministers, members of our parliamentary party. And, you know, it's really important that we continue to be creative about these issues. It's, I often say we have an unfinished democracy, but it's unfinished business as well in this area. We have to keep responding to new challenges. And of course, COVID-19 has thrown up many challenges. Uh, the, the Care Commission is going to be an important place where these ideas can be discussed and taken forward. I'm very happy to be working on a European care strategy and a position paper for our European party, the European People's Party, which we'll have in the next few weeks. And I think that hopefully will make a contribution as well. And there what we'll be doing is, you know, collecting data, sharing best practice, looking at gender equality, work life balance and making sure that across Europe we're dealing with these issues. But today we've been discussing what's happening here in Ireland. And I think there's a really strong agenda 
that has come out of these discussions. And again, my sincere thanks to each and every one of you. I think it's been really encouraging to see the care and the compassion that's come through in these motions and the concern for individuals and families and indeed communities in Ireland and suggestions on how to make things better. So we'll finish at this point. Thank you again, Josepha, uh, Richard, Clodagh and Nikki, and everyone who's been involved in our discussions on making Ireland a fairer and more caring place. Thanks very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.